Okay. Welcome back to another week of CIS 194. I do want to start with a reminder that tonight you need to submit something. If you haven't done so yet, submit something, anything, if you're a Cabrillo student, to Canvas. If I do not see anything submitted for you, I will have to drop you, at which point you'll have to email me to get reinstated, and it's just a whole nother mess. So tonight is when census is due. So if you haven't done absolutely anything for the class, but you've been watching, at the very, very least, please go under modules and complete the VTEA survey. I need to show proof that you are active in the course. So if you are if, if you are just watching this now and realizing, holy moly, he's about to drop me, the answer is yes, I will be dropping you if you don't submit something. If you have submitted something, you're perfectly fine and don't need to worry. Otherwise, um, yeah, that is tonight. Tonight, Monday the 14th. Outside of that, we're going to continue going through our uh, three chapters a week with our usual lecture review, our NetLab stuff, and our quiz. Nothing too crazy. Uh, we still have another, another two more modules of doing this, and then uh, things will change up a bit. So with that, let's get right to it. These three chapters are pretty basic. For example, if you have done some networking and you should have done some networking like CIS 81 or Network Essentials or something to do with networking, if you've done that before, this chapter is nothing but review. Uh, the following chapter will be a lot of basic functionality that we use all the time. Uh, and this will cover uh, some things like Hyper-V. So for the most part, this week's content is pretty much a breeze. If at any point, though, there is something that you want me to dig into further, please say so in the chat. As always, I have all the chats up from YouTube to Zoom to Discord. So if you have a question, ask away. Uh, so Windows 10, as with all the prior versions, support uh, basic networking. That's how they can connect with each other. And if you're on a Windows computer uh, watching this, you're already on a network. The Networking Sharing Center is kind of the way that you manage a small group of systems. Not, you don't use that for a domain. You use that if you're at a, you know, if anything under 20, you can use that as a central point for configuring uh, what network you are part of. Uh, so here you can set things like IP addresses and setting up uh, dial-up VPN, that kind of stuff. Uh, the location, the network location awareness thing. When you, know, when you jump into a new network, it'll ask you like what, what type of network is this? Is this a home? Is this a, a private public domain? That actually ties with the firewall. If you ever wondered why that thing shows up, and you have to select one and then it, and then it says, okay, uh, settings have taken effect. That's because it's applying firewall rules and you can change the firewall rules for a domain or for a public for private. And whenever you jump to that network, those rules will apply. So just because you're on a home network and you choose, let's say the public, uh, and then you wonder why things aren't showing up. Well, it's probably because you selected public network and that has the most uh, stringent rules in the firewall. You might want to change that to private or home. Uh, your network cards are your connections. Clients and services are those that it connects to, like printer or uh, the internet, that kind of stuff. Uh, here you have all the various items that uh, the NIC card can use to connect. So for example, file and printer sharing, if that's enabled, you can share files and printers. Uh, you can do quality of service. 
Uh, you can do ver, uh, TC or IPv4. There is another option for IPv6. They are included when you install Windows. They are there. You can turn them on or off as needed. A general rule of thumb, if you don't need it, turn it off. You have a series of protocols uh, that are listed. So like IPv4, IPv6, uh, link layer topologies, both mapper responder and LLDP. Again, if you're not using LLDP in a network, you should turn it off. Uh, if you're not using V4, you should turn that off. The network driver, if you are unfamiliar, and this is true of any driver, they are basically the translator between the hardware and the software. You should always install drivers from verified trusted sources. Never install stuff just blatantly from the internet. Uh, version four is not so much the most popular networking protocol. V6 has really taken over. It hasn't taken over every single aspect of life, but there is quite a large usage of V6. The next couple of slides kind of go over how V4 works. Again, if you are completely unfamiliar with how uh, IP V4 addressing and V6 addressing works, you should take a networking class because uh, this stuff really goes over uh, broadly. So here's what IPv4 looks like. Uh, you have the old classes that we don't really use anymore. We use CIDR instead. Uh, the, uh, the loopback address, 127.0.0.1. I used to have a, a background that said, uh, there's no place like 127.0.0.1. You have your, uh, your addresses that don't route out, but you can use NAT, which again, if you are unfamiliar with these terms, you should take a networking course. But at this point, I assume you have taken a networking course, and so this is more refresher. You have your subnet masks, which are much easier to handle with CIDR. I always had a hard time remembering the, uh, the classes much easier to do the CIDR notations. In every network that's connected to the internet or really any network that's connected to another network, you have to have a router to act as the intermediary. And uh, in that, that network, you need to have a default gateway whenever a packet is going to get out and it doesn't know where it's going to go. It always goes to the default gateway before knowing where to go next. It is possible to turn Windows into a router. I would not suggest it. That just sounds like a bad idea. Uh, having a, a desktop operating system function as a router, that that just, that just sounds bad. Uh, primarily, because it's a desktop operating system, it's not going to be optimized to handle a large swath of packets and be able to process those quickly. But also, because it's a desktop operating system, it's going to have more vulnerabilities than with something like, uh, like Linux's um, under PFSense. Uh, in what case? I don't know. I would not. I guess in a, in a complete and utter emergency and there's just no other way and you need it. But I would, I would never suggest it upon anybody, including my enemies, to use Windows as a router. We do use Windows for DNS. Uh, there's a lot of DNS servers, and actually, we'll get into the back end of DNS servers in the second eight weeks of this course. Uh, but DNS, we use it. If DNS isn't working, 
people complain that the internet isn't working, but it's really just the, the name resolution. A uh, big point is all operating systems, regardless of, uh, of what it is, they all start by looking at their host file to see if an entry for the server or the, the resource exists there. So if you are malicious, you want to target that file. You want to make edits to that file to redirect traffic. All modern operating systems have made it harder for a, a unauthorized application or user to make changes to this file, but note that if your machine is acting funny, but your DNS server is properly configured, it probably means that the host file has been messed with because it is always the first place any and all modern operating systems go to before they go and, and reach out to a DNS server on the network, before a packet is made to request where is google.com. They will always look at the host file. WINS is an old technology. I hope you don't have WINS on in your network unless you're running an old version of Windows. Otherwise, uh, turn that off. No need to run outdated protocols that provide backward compatibility and expose you to those, uh, to those vulnerabilities. You can configure IPv4 via uh, dynamic, which is by far the easiest. That way we don't have to touch every system. If it doesn't get an address dynamically, you'll get the IPPA address, the 169254. That's how you know it did not get an address from the DHCP server. That's always a, a trick question. So here you can set it up automatic or you can configure it yourself. Now this list, whether you know networking or not, this is a good list to have. This is a good list to know. Knowing the commands that you can run in order to get information you need to troubleshoot. That is something that you guys should know. So, so far, uh, I would say slide 25 is a good note to have. 26 kind of shows you what you can do with IP config, but you can see this whole list if you went to like ss64.com um, or if you just did IP config and you did uh, slash help, you would see this stuff too. Uh, same with ping. You can go to ss64 and see the full list of what you can do with ping and what each uh, flag means. Same with netstat. Use the command line to troubleshoot any problems. Uh, our always go to is ping. And then from there, see what, what's happening. Do we have an IP address? Can we ping the default gateway? Can we ping out to the world? And you know, step by step, working from the end device that the complaining user is on all the way out as far as we can on our network. IPv6, of course, is the improvement to v4. Used primarily out on major networks. Can also be used at home, should be used at home. Eventually, v4 will finally die and it'll be just a v6 world. You should know how v6 works. And again, um, if you are unfamiliar, please, please, please do yourself a favor and take a networking course. And even a, a basic networking course will be fine. That'll, that'll take care of covering how all this works. Because there's a lot more information that is not provided in, in this course because it, it kind of assumes you have that knowledge. Um, just again, a quick reminder of IPv6 um, terms. You have your link local unicast, your global unicast, your unique uh, local. We don't have broadcast. In IPv6, we have multicasts and anycast.
Torito is one of the ways that you can take uh, you can take V6 into a V4 network. There are two other main ways that you can take a uh, V6 network packet through a V4 network. Torito is one that Windows knows natively. The others you would have to add. Uh, just like V4, you can configure it statically or automatic or use scripts in order to configure. Automatic can be done by either the stateful automatic or the stateless automatic. And Windows can do local resolutions by using LLMNR. All things that are covered in networking classes, including my Wireshark class, where you actually see these packets in action. Just like a V4, the same uh, troubleshooting steps can be taken to find out what's happening on a, on a network and why a end device is not connecting. Um, I would not use Telnet. Telnet is an outdated and insecure protocol. I would not use that to test application. I would rather use ping or other tools. Now, file sharing is something that we're used to. Nowadays, we can just do it on the cloud, which provides actually a much more secure fashion to share files and be able to collaboratively be share files. But if you're sharing it uh, in a local network, file sharing is the way to go. You can share a public folder. Those folders are already available. You can just put files into those, into those public folders and it will be instantly available to any on the network. You can enable passwords just in case. But just know that anything that is in the public folders in your Windows, that machine is automatically shared. You can also share any folder like you have in all other versions of Windows. You can do the share with and you can uh, enable permissions if it's an FTFS, NTFS formatted system. So the, the way that you share hasn't necessarily changed. The place that you go to do it uh, now lies within that ribbon, but it used to easily be that you could just right click into properties and then be able to share uh, whatever folder you're looking at. There is advanced sharing, and this has been around since like Vista, of uh, uh, having more granular permissions on, as to who can do what. Here's the advanced, you click on permissions, you can choose what user can do what. So like this, uh, who can share the folder, what's the name of it, how many uh, connections can be, happen at the same time, any comments, any permissions, et cetera, et cetera. Computer management will show you what shares are available and who has access to what. It's kind of neat. It's not, um, not totally comprehensive, but under shared folders in computer management, that's where you can see what folder is being shared and how many people are connected to it and who's connected to it. Um, internet connectivity, the little thingy that tells you, uh, hey, I'm, it's connected. How, how is it connected? It could be cable, it could be DSL, it could be dial-up, it could be wireless. I still don't think it's a good idea to have Windows be a router. That is weird. But it is possible to tether from Windows and make turn it into a, uh, a router and, and share a connection. I just, I would not, uh, I would not do it myself. I would do it for fun just to see, uh, like Mr. Farley said, of testing it out and see what, what it does. Uh, I wouldn't do it myself. 
Wireless, obviously, as long as you have a wireless card, you can uh, connect to a wireless network. No wireless card, no wireless network. You can create a wireless connection several ways, from manually doing it, copying a profile through the command line, through group policy, and even Wi-Fi Sense. You have all these options that you need to configure whether you're doing it uh, through the GUI or through the uh, command line. Uh, you should not use any network that is open. That is always bad. That's like saying secrets in a crowded room. That's not a good idea. Uh, also, don't use WEP as an encryption type. That has been defeated over and over again. Uh, you can use AES and WPA2, although WPA2 has been broken thanks to the, the crack vulnerability. WPA3 is supposed to be our current secure way to communicate, but that's not out yet. Here's the, uh, the Wi-Fi status that you see in Windows. Troubleshooting wireless, your best way to troubleshoot wireless is the same as wired. You start at the end user and work your way up. So doing things like, is the wireless card on? Is it on the right network? Does it have the right password? Does it have the right IP address? If everything checks out proper there, then you move on to see, is there any interference? Like, is this machine sitting next to a microwave? or sitting next to another device that is emanating uh, a Wi-Fi signal that's interfering and then move your way up to the access point and then through the network. Windows has a firewall. Please use it. It exists for a reason. Please do not just take it for granted. Please do not just leave it unconfigured. Actually make some changes to your firewall because Microsoft put a basic template there that you should modify as system admins. Just because the private, uh, the private profile exists does not mean it's automatically secure to go on a public network. You should fine tune it. Because everybody knows what is in that private profile so they know what is blocked and what isn't blocked and will use the things that, that are not blocked to get in. So yes, the firewall is enabled, but again, it's a default template. Please make sure that you make some changes to it. That is what it looks from the basic stance in control panel. But you really want to get into the advanced configuration that shows you more complex rules and shows you what's happening. That is the place you want to be. Again, you have your three main profiles that you can edit, the domain, private, and public. Uh, domain is obviously editable from the domain controller, not so much uh, locally. But you have some basic settings that you can change. IPsec is also here. If you just so happen to have a system with IPsec, you can use that to do the key exchange authentication method and have that configured. All the rules are editable. You can edit them in the properties and you have quite the number of tabs that you can go into to edit. You can make new rules. There's a nice little wizard that'll help you. Here's a, a quick little picture of that, of the actions that you can take. You can use IPsec to authenticate between two computers, kind of like a VPN tunnel. You can see what's happening by monitoring the rules and the connections uh, that happened, which is great. You should always audit before you set any rules. 
uh, home group networks, those are local. Those are not connected out to the internet. Uh, those are useful when you have the 20 or less systems that are all sharing, kind of like, like a home network, really. Um, I do see some questions. So will we have access to the free education edition of Windows 10 and Windows Server throughout this class? Uh, through Google Cloud, you'll have access to Windows Server. And if you don't have access to Google Cloud, let me know and I can get you some credits. So you can use Windows Server on the cloud. Uh, backtrack to Wi-Fi, the difference between EAP and PSK are the encryption. EAP and PSK, uh, let me just go back to that slide, where did it go? Yeah, personal uh, enterprise, uh, well EA, EAP, and PSK are two ways to encrypt uh, traffic. So what, what you're basically saying is we're gonna use a WPA2 why, uh, as the basis and we're gonna use either PSK or EAP to encrypt our traffic. PSK tends to be the one that is used more often than EAP. I believe with EAP, uh, you need to uh, have uh, like an 802.1 certificate. Um, a downloadable ISO, I do not have access to downloadable ISOs. But through uh, Google, I can get you access to machines on the cloud. Uh, 